This podcast is brought to you by its financial supporters on Patreon, Zach, Breck, Jed, Tom, Alex, Christine, and Jeff. Thank you for helping me to have these conversations and to create this content. Keep Talking exists to have conversations that might help to make a better society and a better culture. If we keep talking to one another, we can learn from each other, engage in good faith, remain curious, consider new perspectives, resist ideology and absolute certainty, embrace doubt, see nuance, seek the truth, change our minds, recognize our vast ignorance, and grow into better versions of ourselves. And in that spirit, I believe that each guest has important information and stories to make public. And it's something that I want to share. Cesar Fracassi is an associate professor of finance and the director of the blockchain initiative at the University of Texas McCombs School of Business. During our conversation, Cesar explains the fundamentals and benefits of cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. Crypto has gained significant momentum, value, and attention in the past few years, and is poised to change our society. Cesar provides a basic overview of where we are and where we might be heading with these technologies. In my view, becoming more educated about these tools is likely to be crucial for anyone attempting to adapt to the future and to secure financial security in it. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Cesar Fracassi. Cesare, um, just wanted to first by, start by saying thanks for uh, giving me the time and, and meeting. It's great to uh, talk to you and welcome to the show. Sure, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, as I was alluding to before we we uh, pressed, pressed record here, I always like to try to get some background on people as to how they end up in the positions that they have in, in uh, their careers and their lives. Um, you work in the Blockchain Institute here at UT. You're the director What's the general story there? How did you get interested in the subject? What brought you here? Absolutely. So uh, let's start from the beginning. I was uh, born and raised in Italy, yeah. in Milan. Uh, I got a bachelor and master degree in electrical engineering mm-hmm. uh, in Milan at the Polytechnic uh, University. Um, I worked in consulting for about four or five years. Then I wanted to do a master in business. And so I applied to several programs, several MBA programs uh, in the US. And I had a choice between like UCLA and NYU. Hmm. And then uh, uh, I decided to go to UCLA just because I've never been to LA. <clears throat> and I love every moment that I was there. Yeah. Uh, I spent uh, two years of MBA uh, in Santa Monica. Uh, and then uh, after the two years of MBA, I realized that I really liked learning and I really liked finance. Yeah. And so I was talking to a faculty at UCLA and he really inspired me to do a PhD and become a professor. And so I, uh, and so I, I, I did my, my PhD in finance at UCLA mm. for another five years. And then after five years, I graduated and uh, UT Austin hired me as, as a faculty. Yeah. Uh, it took me about seven years to get tenure. Um, after I got tenure, so, most of my research and teaching has to do about corporate finance. So how companies make financial decisions. Yeah. So that's how what I teach. That's uh, uh, what I do research on. Hmm. And then after I got tenure, um, I've always been interested in technology yeah. uh, because of my background as electrical engineering. And um, and so back in 2015, 2016, fintech started to to become uh, uh, a thing, and, and so I decided I actually wanted to learn a lot more about fintech. Uh, at the same time, also cryptocurrency started and, and Bitcoin and so on started to be, become very popular. And so I spent a lot of time learning about fintech and learning about uh, blockchain. Hmm. Um, and one way to actually learn about something is actually to talk to experts. And so uh, I started talking to people over the country about uh, about blockchain and about fintech. And then we organized this very large uh, uh, conference uh, in 2018 about blockchain. And after that, we, as a university, we decided to create something more permanent in terms of uh, uh, an entity a center point for the university for everything that has to do with blockchain. Mm. 
and so we uh, we created this uh, this blockchain initiative at the University of Texas. Hmm. And, and the initiative has three, and, and I lead this initiative yep. as, as a the director. Uh, the initiative has three main goals. The first one is uh, uh, to provide funding for uh, faculty and PhD students to do research on blockchain technology. UT is a, is, a, is a research university, and so we do a lot of research on different topics. And so we thought it was going to be good to provide funding for faculty to do research on blockchain technology. Uh, the second goal is uh, to provide more teaching on, on uh, to students uh, on blockchain technology. And so now we have uh, several programs where there are classes that are specifically focused on, on blockchain technology. So if you want to learn about how Bitcoin works, how supply chain blockchain works, uh, we have specific courses on that. Hmm. Uh, the third leg of the, of the initiative has to do with... Uh, you know, the initiative being the, the, the nexus for, uh, for everything on blockchain on campus. So, you know, I'm here doing a podcast with you. Uh, that, that's, that's part of the role of the initiative is to, to, to connect uh, uh, local companies, students, faculty uh, through, the, the, through the initiatives. Gotcha. So the, these these are the three main goals of, of an initiative. I lead the initiative together with a, a, a faculty committee of people from all over campus. Uh, we have uh, faculty from the law school, uh, faculty from electrical engineering, uh, the Dell Medical School, uh, from from the business school, from the School of Information. So one of the features of blockchain is that it really is pervasive in terms of topics. Mm. And so it's about supply chain, it's about identity, it's about finance, uh, operations, uh, uh, legal issues. And so I feel the university are very well set up to, to, to learn, to, to, to explore and do research on this, because especially at a school like UT, we, we excel in many different areas. Yeah. And so bringing together all these faculty from all over different departments and, and colleges um, is, is really providing a value added. Yeah. And for, for people who are listening to this who have heard these terms, you mentioned too, uh, fintech and blockchain technologies. Yeah. Uh, maybe it would be helpful just to start by defining those terms so that people have a basic understanding of what those mean. Absolutely. So uh, let's start with fintech. Yeah. Uh, fintech is a financial technology. Uh, essentially what it is, is how do we use technology to improve financial service products and to create new and better products? Obviously, the financial sector has used technology for hundreds of years, yeah. right? but there has been a three main evolutions uh, in, in technology that are really changing the way financial products are created, delivered, and managed. Uh, so I, I teach a, a fintech class to uh, <clears throat> undergrad students, graduate students, and, and what I teach is I teach three main technologies, uh, blockchain technology, machine learning, and uh, IoT or APIs. Hmm. And so well, what I teach is uh, I first illustrate what the technology is, hmm. I explain uh, uh, how the technology works, and then uh, how it is applied in finance. Yep. And so fintech means financial technology is the use of technology in finance. For the most part, these three emerging technologies are what, what fintech is, is really about. Yeah. And, and it seems like right now a lot of the attention is on blockchain specifically. I think a lot of people are still confused as to what the hell this is <laughs> because they it's it's a little difficult to wrap your head around this if you've never actually engaged in Bitcoin exchange or Ethereum. Shed some light on that. What exactly yeah. are we talking about here? So first of all, it's true that from a market perspective, blockchain is is very popular right now. But also, I mean, machine learning has been has been there for thirty years now yeah. and has been completely changed the, the way business operates in many different industries. Uh, API is something very new that, uh, that people are using more and more. It's a very simple technology. Mm. But uh, um, I'm just saying that blockchain is not the only yeah. uh, you know, thing that is actually changing the financial sector. I think yeah. there are these three main technologies that are really revolutionizing the, the industry. Gotcha. So going back to blockchain. Yeah. <clears throat> so what is blockchain? 
Uh, blockchain is, is a simple, the simpler way to describe it is, is, is a distributed ledger. So it's a ledger that is distributed. What does it mean to have a distributed ledger? Uh, so I'm going to try to explain it in the simplest possible <laughs> way. We all so appreciate be, that. Be, before we talk about uh, distributed ledger, let's talk about ledgers. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what is a ledger? A ledger is just uh, uh, a database uh, uh, that tracks transactions. So think about uh, when I go and uh, buy coffee at a coffee shop, you know, I provide uh, my credit card, I swipe my credit card, uh, the transaction is created uh, by the merchant, the, 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 the message is sent to my bank, mm -hmm. my bank tells uh, uh, the coffee shop, yes, you know, uh, Cesare Fracassi has the money, and so you can give him coffee and the money is, is, is sent to, to the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. uh? So this is a transaction, yeah. and this transaction goes into a ledger. Uh, another ledger is uh, uh, when uh, uh, food gets moved by Walmart from the farmers to the shelves. So every time the, the, the piece of lettuce moves from the farmer to the wholesaler, the wholesaler to the distributor, the distributor to the shelves of Walmart, there is a transaction. Mm -hmm. Uh, another transaction every time you buy and sell stocks, that's a transaction that goes yep. into a ledger. Uh, every time uh, uh, you, um, uh, so transfer of human capital. So when when people graduate from UT, now they are <clears throat> graduating for the University of Texas. That is a transaction that happened between the university and this, and, and and the student that basically says. You took all these classes, so you graduated. That is a transaction that goes into the UT database, mm -hmm. so that uh, uh, you know we're gonna give you a nice piece of paper. It's called diploma, and uh, but that's a transaction that, that enriches your human capital mm -hmm. and goes on your resume. Huh? So, pretty much the broader definition of a ledger is anything that maps uh, economic and social relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, see, you can see the definition of a ledger is very, it's very wide. broad. Yeah. It's very, very broad, okay? Now, the question is, how do you manage a ledger? And there are two ways to manage a ledger. You, have, you can do it centralized or decentralized. Uh -huh. So if you think about the history of ledgers, so who invented ledgers? Uh, I don't know, probably some, somebody in Mesopotamia 3,000 years ago yeah. huh? or in, Egy in Egypt. You know, when they invented writing, they started recording transactions, yeah. you know. And so the way we have been handling ledgers or databases of transactions has been centralized for 3,000 years. Centralized means there is just one single entity that uh, owns the ledger, decides whether the transaction go on the ledger or not. Mm -hmm. There's just one person. So when I go and buy coffee, the banks own the ledgers. And basically, the bank is the one in charge of deciding is this transaction valid or not. Mm. If I don't have the money, or if somebody uses my card fraudulently, uh, the bank stops the transaction. Yep. So the bank is the central entity that decides whether the transaction is valid or not. Uh, in the case of uh, supply chain, Walmart has their own ERP system uh, that decides whether it's true the lettuce moved from... Uh, from the wholesaler to the distributor. Mm. Huh? So there is there is always a central party that owns the ledger and decides uh, whether the transaction is valid or not. Uh, in the case of stocks, when you buy a stock, uh, <coughs> the NYSC uh, is a stocks exchange, it's the one that actually has the ledger that decides whether the transaction happened or not, it's valid or not. Mm. Huh? So since until 2009, the only way to manage a ledger was uh, through a centralized uh, central party. The state, the bank, the NYSC, and the company, and so on. Huh? Now, evolution in, uh, in technology and cryptography allowed us to think about ledger in a different way. Huh? And now, there are going to be pros and cons about, but th the point is that now, now with technologies and uh, and with cryptography, now we can uh, manage a ledger not in a centralized way, but in a decentralized way. Okay, what does it mean a decentralized way? It means that there is not just a single central party that decides whether <clears throat> I have the money and I can buy coffee. 
So right now, I buy coffee, so I'm a credit card. The bank is in charge of deciding whether I have the money or not and allow the transaction or not. Yeah. Now, in a decentralized ledger, it means that there is not just a central party that decides whether you can buy coffee or not, but it's the whole network that comes together and decides whether you have the money to buy coffee or not. So if I could use Bitcoin to, to buy coffee, and so what I would do, I would go to a coffee shop, I will you know, show my QR code of my, of my, of my, of my public key, I sign it, uh, and then I, the, the merchant sends the message, not to the bank, but to all the nodes in the Bitcoin network. And then all the nodes in the Bitcoin network are going to come together and they're going to decide, uh, is the transaction valid or not? And if the transaction is valid, then I get my, my, my coffee and the, and, the sh- and the coffee shop gets uh, uh, the, the, the part of, fraction of a Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, and so what is the difference? At the end, the difference is that in the central in the centralized ledger, there is just one party that decides whether the transaction is valid or not. In a decentralized ledger, Bitcoin blockchain is basically that mm. uh, the whole network decides. Okay, that's the fundamental difference. Yeah. That's the difference between the two. And when you say the whole network decides, mm-hmm. how does that process work? What does that mean? Absolutely. So this is the innovation. This is the reason why people use centralized ledgers over decentralized ledger for 3000 years <laughs> because it's it's very very hard for you know a group of people a network of individual to come together so think about it the bitcoin network there are about 12000 nodes hmm. so 12000 entities hmm. that they have to come together and agree whether i have enough bitcoin to buy to pay for coffee hmm. huh? so the big question conceptually is fascinating how does a network of people that don't know who they are everything is anonymous in bitcoin they are all over the world you know in argentina in italy in the us in africa and so on all over the world people that don't know each other they don't even know who they are because it's anonymous but still they can come together and agree and the, no, the, the, there might be people that are trying to pass fraudulent transaction. There are yeah. people that might try to steal your Bitcoin and spend your Bitcoin for you, pretend it to be you. You know. So how do we create a system where uh, <clears throat> the network comes together and agree on validating valid transactions and preventing illegal transactions? All right? And so that's that's the beauty of what Satoshi Nakamoto invent in 2009 he was the first one that put together all these pieces in a way so that every node in a network has the incentive to do the right thing hmm. technically speaking yeah. how the hell does that work how, how is that how is that even technically possible that's that's the challenge so I will let you have to take my class uh, if, you really, if you really want to, if you really want to understand the fine details but I can try to summarize in five minutes. Sure. Um, the idea is that uh, <clears throat> everything is separated into blocks. That's why it's called blockchain. Okay, and uh, and so let's assume there is a, a new transaction. The transaction get put into blocks, and then all the transaction into blocks get verified by each one of the nodes in the network. Mm. Huh? So the first, uh, so people started to think about, oh, maybe people can vote. You know, what if people vote? You know, so uh, if there are ten thousand nodes in network, if uh, people vote and uh, and five, m- more than fifty percent of the vo- of the nodes decide the transaction is valid, maybe this is, the transaction is valid. Mm-hmm. Right? That that is problematic. That, that that wouldn't work. The reason it wouldn't work is is because of uh, two reasons. The first reason is every time you have voting, you need to have somebody that collects the votes. Okay, and you need to have a central institution that collects the votes and count them. So how do you do that? The second is uh, is what's called civil attack. <laughs> a civil attack means that what prevents me to go on AWS, Amazon, uh, <coughs> on Amazon, create 10,001 new nodes. Remember, Bitcoin is an open network, is a permissionless network, meaning that you can create your own node with your own desktop. <laughs> okay? You can download the software, join the P2P network, 
everybody can join it. So what prevents me, if I know that there are 10,000 nodes out there, what prevents me to create 10,001 new nodes yep. under me? Yep. And so I can manipulate the voting. I can steal your Bitcoin and then I can vote that the transaction is valid because uh, I own the majority of votes. Huh? So voting doesn't work. Yep. So that's one of the problems is like, well, if you cannot vote, how do you have 10,000 people that don't know each other, that you know, they are totally anonymous? How do you make them do the right thing? Yep. Yeah. Okay. What's the answer? To that? <laughs> the answer is, um, <clears throat> this is the beauty of Satoshi Nakamoto. The answer is a proof of work. Huh? So the idea is the following. Uh, in order to uh, in order to vote, think about that. I'm gonna I'm simplifying this. Okay. Sure. In order to vote, you have to do certain work. Meaning work means they are solving some kind of cryptographic puzzles. Okay. Think about that that's the mining, you know, the people say, Oh, sure. Bitcoin wastes so much energy and so on. The reason why they waste so much energy is because um, in your vote depends on how much work you do. Hmm. Okay? So think about think about this. It's not cor totally correct, but th that's a good analogy. The more work you do in solving this meaningless cryptographic puzzle, the more your vote counts. Yeah. Okay? So why it doesn't make sense for me to create 10,000 instances on AWS to try to manipulate to manipulate the vote? Because it doesn't matter how many nodes I have. What matters is how much computing power I have to solve these puzzles. Right? Yeah. And so what is the only way to manipulate Bitcoin transactions? Is if I own more than 50% of the computing power of the network. Okay. So nowadays it costs uh, about... Uh, we're talking about $20 billion to, one, to manipulate one transaction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not many people have $20 billion, <laughs> $20 billion to, to, to do that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so this is the whole idea. The whole idea is that the, it's what we, Sato Kushi Nakamoto came out with, which is proof of work. It basically says you're going to vote, but your vote is proportional to how much work you have done, how much computing power did you use to solve these cryptographic puzzles, yeah, and uh, and, and 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 so now uh, that's why there are all these mining equipment that yeah. are working twenty four seven trying to solve all these cryptographic puzzles, because that's the only way to ensure that uh, people come to a consensus when they agree on uh, on whether transactions are valid or not. Yeah. I think it's becoming more common knowledge in the culture that there are, are a variety of options with blockchain technologies. Bitcoin seems to be the OG yeah. and is the most commonly known name. Yeah. What what have they done or what did they do that has allowed them to be the clear front runner in the space? They, they were the first one. Actually, technologically speaking, Bitcoin is the oldest and it's probably not the, the most innovative one, hmm. you know, uh, and there is a reason for that. Uh, most of the value in Bitcoin is because people like the fact that Bitcoin has been there for nowadays, now 12 years and hasn't changed. Hmm. So people will talk about Bitcoin as the new gold huh? and the digital gold. Yeah. And, uh, in order for gold to be there, it cannot change. Yeah. Okay. If you start messing around with uh, some of the protocol of Bitcoin, then people start to worry that oh, maybe oh yeah, you change this thing this time. Maybe you're gonna instead of having 21 million Bitcoin, you're gonna double it. Yeah. And so, if people start messing around with with the protocol of Bitcoin too much, yeah. then people start to get nervous that well, this is really not a store of value because you are changing too much. Yeah. So. There are two main camps in, in, in cryptos. One is Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is there. It's not really going to change very much because its value comes from the fact it doesn't change. Yeah. And then there is the other camp, which is the more the Ethereum part. Ethereum has been very, very active in making the blockchain more and more modern, faster, better, and so on. And... Um, 
And, and so they've been changing things along and they're still changing it. Try to scale the network to make it cheaper because right now transaction, verification of transaction is very, very expensive, hmm. both on Bitcoin and it, in Ethereum. Hmm. And so Bitcoin started in 2009. Ethereum came about in 2015. Yeah. And Ethereum is a different type of crypto. So sometimes people ask me, why do we need, uh, and now I think there are 9,000 cryptocurrencies. Yeah. Okay, well, why do I need 9,000 <laughs> cryptocurrencies? Do I just need one? Is one enough? Well, the answer is um, the way you manage a ledger can be very different. Huh? So, you know, the, the way the bank manages its own ledger is very different from the way Walmart manages the supply ledger. Hmm. You know, and so every so so every crypto it's a little different, and that, that's because the, the 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 use case the application is different. So, for example, Ethereum is actually technologically different from uh, Bitcoin because Ethereum the objective of Ethereum is to be the decentralized computer of the world. Hmm. So, what does it mean? It means uh, that uh, Ethereum. The, the 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 big difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum is that Ethereum has what are called smart contracts. Yeah. I don't know if you if you heard about smart sure, contracts. Yeah. And so the, w what a smart contract is, it basically is a set of instruction that basically says, uh, well, if A, B, C, and D happen, then money flows from person A to person B. So in Bitcoin, you can simply send the money from person A to person B, but you cannot attach any condition to that. Huh? In Ethereum, through smart contract, you can say, hey, send money from A to B only if all these uh, you know things happened yeah so this simple difference created an immense ecosystem of what are called decentralized applications okay so now it can create dapps are called decentralized applications that you they basically are smart contracts you know so an example is Let's assume that you and I, we want to bet on uh, who's going to win the NBA uh, championship. Yeah. Huh? And uh, uh, you're going to say Lakers. You lived in LA for a long time. You're going to say Lakers. I'm going to say San Antonio because I, <laughs> obviously San Antonio is probably not going to win it. But <laughs> probably true. let's say Lakers and let's say San Antonio. Okay. So we can create a smart contract. It basically says, hey, smart contracts, go on the ESPN page on July 4th. I don't know when this is the last NBA final. Go on the ESPN page. ESPN page, find who wins the uh, NBA championship. And then if it's the Lakers, Cesare sends one Ethereum to Dan. If it's not, Dan sends one Ethereum to Cesare. Okay? Yeah. So this is a simple smart contract. We can sit down and write it down in 10 minutes. Huh? And then we can send it to the network and say, hey, you and I, we agreed on this type of contract. And then the network itself is going to execute it. The, the network is going to wait until July 1st. And then they're gonna, you know, get the information that they need, and then they automatically execute the transaction. Mm. Okay, so you can see that now the transaction is only a small part of the application. Yeah. Okay, but it's embedded, in, embedded into it. You know, and so there is this universe of DeFi, you know, decentralized finance applications where the, the, there are all. There is basically a software. Think about an app with a payment system that is triggered automatically by certain tasks that happen inside the app. Hmm. Huh? Yeah. And uh, and so this is what Ethereum does. So Bitcoin is not able to do that because Bitcoin doesn't have smart contracts. So Bitcoin is simply, can, you can think about simply a, a, a money transfer mechanism from yeah. one person to another. Yeah. You know, an old boring money transfer <laughs> mechanism, but with no condition attached. Now with Ethereum, you can create very complex, uh, so, um, Think about you know I'm a so do you, I don't know you know what op stock options are sure yeah like a call option yeah. or a put option a put option or a call option is a smart contract that basically says uh, if the strike price if the stock price is above the strike price uh, pay the owner of the call option the difference between the stock price and the strike price yeah if not don't execute the option yeah yeah and so that's a smart contract so yeah. one way to, for me to engage in a smart contract in a, in a call option with you will be for us to buy and sell it on the on the uh, uh, Chicago board exchange yeah or we can enter into a smart contracts on ethereum 
five lines of code that basically says, hey, at the maturity date, expiration date of the options, go check uh, uh, what the price of the uh, of the stock is. If it's above the strike price, then transfer money from a person A to person B. Yeah. Is Ethereum also able to do the Bitcal Bitcoin style simple yeah, yeah, delivery yeah, as well? You can say no condition attached. Gotcha. Um, I think what has gotten a lot of people's attention about these platforms is the word has kind of gotten out that a lot of people have gotten very rich who mm -hmm. have held these uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum for many years and now the price is skyrocketing. Um, you seem to have a rather deep knowledge about the variety. I think you said there are 9,000 mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies in total. Do you have a personal bet, not necessarily financially, but just in your judgment right now, when you look at the field, which of these, I'm sure you get this question a lot, do you do you find to be the most long-term compelling option for the public generally? Mm. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Mm. And this is a question I should get a lot. I bet. Okay? <laughs> it's like, should I buy Bitcoin or not? <laughs> uh, should I buy Ethereum? Which crypto do I need to buy? Okay? And so I, you know, not only I teach uh, FinTech and Bitcoin, but also in, in blockchain, but also teach uh, how to value stocks. So uh, to MBA, sometimes I also teach uh, valuation. Yeah. You know? And so I always tell my students that just because a company is good, it doesn't mean that you have to buy the stock. Yeah. So let me give an example. Tesla makes uh, great cars, innovative, and, and, and the future of Tesla is very bright. Okay. So should I buy Tesla stocks? Well, Tesla's are very expensive because everybody else, in, in addition to me, they, they know that Tesla is going to have a very bright future. Mm. And so they forecast very high profit uh, for Tesla, and therefore the value of the Tesla stock is very high. So just because a company is good doesn't mean you have to buy it. Yeah. Just because a company is bad doesn't mean you have to sell it. Yeah. You know, sometimes bad stock, bad companies are great buys. Why? Because maybe people are even too pessimistic. Yeah. Maybe you you don't think that the company is doing well, but maybe the market thinks the company is going even worse, and then you can still make money out of it. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm trying to, what I usually tell my students is, make sure you separate how you feel about the company versus how you feel about the stock price of the sure. company. Yeah. They're two different things. Yeah. Okay. So the same thing applies for cryptos. Just because the technology is very good, it doesn't mean that you have to buy that underlying uh, crypto. Yeah. Because again, everybody else knows that the technology is very good and therefore the price is very high. All right? And so in my view, I find these idea of smart contracts to be essential in any crypto. You know? And so from a technological perspective, I see Ethereum to, to have great opportunity for a, a, a vast uh, a uh, number of applications yeah. in the business world, in the finance world, and so on. Yeah. So I can see how Ethereum, especially now, now they're trying to make Ethereum faster, cheaper, and so on, especially in the next two years, they nail down uh, these scalability issues. And in two years, if they come out with a, they're called Ethereum 2.0, with a new form of Ethereum that scales much better and is much faster and cheaper, I can see that to be an incredible achievement and a lot of people are going to start using it. Yeah. And 2.0 is forthcoming. It's not out it's yet. Forthcoming. Yeah. It's forthcoming. It's uh, forthcoming. They started to the, the first wave of uh, it, it, it's, it's a slow process. Yeah. Okay. So if they achieve that, I can see how Ethereum might become a platform that a lot of people are going to use. Yeah. Is it possible to reverse engineer or re-engineer Bitcoin to provide that kind of functionality or is that just undoable to your point you, earlier? You, you can, yeah. but people don't want to. Yeah. Because if you, first of all, you start copying what Ethereum is doing. Well, we already have Ethereum doing that. Uh, Bitcoin, yes, they're, they're trying to think about, you know, lightning network, ways to make transaction cheaper. Uh, but again, the, the use case of Bitcoin is digital gold. Yeah. Okay. It's gold. It's the big advantage of Bitcoin is it hasn't changed. Okay. It's, it's, and hopefully it always be what Satoshi Nakamoto invented in 2009. Yeah. 
And so there is a reliability. So the reason why gold is gold, why is gold, why, who cares about gold? Okay, I, I don't have gold in my portfolio. Okay, mm -hmm. why? Because gold doesn't pay you dividends. Mm -hmm. Okay, it doesn't make profit. Okay, the only reason why gold has value is because other people think gold has value. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, and so when I buy a, a share of uh, Microsoft, I don't need to rely on other people thinking that Microsoft has value. You know, if Microsoft really is good, they're going to pay me dividends yeah. down the road. And so I'm going to be rich because Microsoft is a very good uh, company that makes profit, that pays me dividends. Yeah. But with gold, I need to rely on other people to continue to, buy continue the story. to believe that whatever, uh, whatever uh, it is, is going to have value. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think the uh, that difference, the, the difference between Bitcoin and, and Ethereum in terms of the smart contracts, it does seem like that would be a, a killer, potential killer innovation, especially in the business world, given the, the importance of having those sort of contract ability built into the, the network and the system. Um, what makes the Ethereum smart contracts so much if it is superior superior in your judgment to what's available currently in the way that contracts tend to be made with businesses or individuals that that's a great question so for example uh, uh I, I talked about call options yeah so when when i buy a call option and then it gets to the expiration of the option is there a human being in the background <laughs> looking at the stock price and strike price no i mean there's a software there yeah that that basically in the clearing house uh that basically does that you know yeah. well you know there's there's a there's a software that looks at the stock price the right price so in a way there already is uh a, a smart contracts you know yeah. a, a software is a smart contracts okay that looked at the price but then um it, it's not attached immediately with that money transfer okay so if you and i <coughs> uh if you and i want to get into uh, a, a bet on whether who wins the NBA championship, okay? I can write a, a Python code that does that, that on July 1st connects and then tells me who won the NBA final. But then I have, how do we exchange payment automatically? Yeah. That's, that's, that's a big hurdle. Yeah. The current payment system is totally detached from, uh, from, from, from other softwares. Okay, and so yes, I'm gonna have to Venmo you the money. Yeah, you know, but it, I cannot write it in my Python code. Yeah. Now with Ethereum, you you the the, the payment trail is embedded into the contract into, the, into the code automatically triggering. It's embedded into the code. Yeah. Not only that, but like if I'm worried that you don't have the money to pay me if the if the Spurs win, uh, actually we're gonna put your money into an escrow account. Yeah automatically your ethereum you know in freezes your ethereum until the the nba final built in escrow Correct, built in escrow yeah totally cheap yeah. now we can still use escrow accounts today so don't get me wrong like we can still do it without ethereum yeah okay but it will be a lot slower and with a lot more frictions yeah it's funny talking about this because it, it, you know getting a civilizational shift to a new technology is often long tedious it requires a lot of education of the populace yeah. so to make that switch if you're bullish on these technologies in winning in the future or at least becoming a staple of global culture where are we in your in your thinking in the timeline here i mean it, it it's it's clear it's becoming more these technologies are becoming more a part of the the zeitgeist, the conversation yeah. among yeah. The, the people who, who live in America, who live around the world. Are we halfway there to it, its peak? W where do you think we are in terms of the, the time frame? So I'm, I'm an educator, yeah. okay? But I disagree with people that says, oh, you know, Bitcoin or blockchain is not used by the masses because we need to educate them. Mm. I, I disagree with this point of view. Do people, the regular people know how machine learning works? <laughs> no, they have no clue. They just use systems that use machine learning. So technology has to be transparent and, and hidden, you know, and, and so that people don't even know that they're using a cryptocurrency, yep. you know? Uh, at the end, when I pay my credit card, I, it's easy, it's convenient, and it works. Yep. 
you know, and if it's it, transaction is fraudulent, yes, I have to spend 10 minutes talking to my credit card company uh, to make sure that they, you know, charge me back uh, the amount that has been spent. Yeah. yeah. So the only way for cryptos uh, or smart contracts to be popular if it, they're simply better yeah. uh, than what we're currently doing. And, uh, and, and so sometimes I show my students, uh, so there is this very interesting video of... Uh, Bill Gates that went to uh, to the Lanterman show, okay, mm -hmm. and um, and and Bill Gates in 1995, Bill Gates tried to convince uh, uh, Lanterman that uh, internet is going to be the new thing, you know, and uh, and this is like a five minutes clip, and it's so interesting to see how back in 1995 yeah. they absolutely have no clue, absolutely no clue what the internet was going to be, okay. And uh, not even Bill Gates. Yeah. So if you ask Bill Gates now, okay, what is the impact of the internet? He is able to articulate very, very well all the incredible things that the internet have done to our daily life. Yeah. Uh, but back, you know, 1995, they have absolutely had no clue what the, the true impact happened. Now, I'm not saying that the same thing is going to happen with blockchain. Okay. But at least this is a technology disruption that is going to create a new platform. Okay, now, whether it's going to be the Internet 2.0 or not, I don't know. Mm, yep. Okay? No. I, I cannot. I, I don't know. What I can see, that has the potential to do it. Yep. You know, that's why when I teach my students, it's like, this is, a, this is a call option for you guys. And it's an option, meaning that it's good for you to know now. Yeah. Because if it does become the Internet 2.0, you have the tools to understand yeah. it. I love those old videos too from the mid 90s yeah, yeah, where, yeah. where people begin to ask questions like, what is the internet? And begin to have some basic explanation given to them about what this thing is. It, yeah, it, clearly yeah. nobody nobody knew what, what, what was coming. But Maybe you can post the video on, the, on, your, <laughs> sure. on your podcast. Sure. It's, it's fascinating what Bill Gates was talking about uh, with David Letterman uh, on the show. Because yeah. it's like, what are, they're talking about, oh, you know, broadcasting baseball games. Yeah. You know, and, and I, they, they absolutely have no clue. Yeah. And what took us, you know, many things took us from there to here, right? Netscape, the Netscape browser, yeah. um, the iPhone, Google. If we're in this beginning era with these cryptocurrencies, and it, let's say hypothetically, just for the sake of conversation, that it does balloon into something mm -hmm. on the, the scale 20, 30 years from now, essentially everyone is using these for, for commerce or for financial transactions. What do you think needs to be invented or what, what needs to happen similarly to the Netscape iPhone Google analogy to make it ubiquitous and to make it as easy as possible for people to use these? Yeah. I mean... Okay, let's go back to the, to, to the no no. Let's go back to the nineties yeah. for the internet. It was incredibly slow. When you download an image, it was like you know, it was like <laughs> just for one I image, remember. it was like I remember, sure, oh, yeah. five minutes, you know, <laughs> you know, and it was dial up. The website were not nice, mm -hmm. you know, very rough design, and the, the user interface was absolutely terrible. Yeah. Okay, now you know everything is you know the user interface uh, is it, beautiful. You yeah. know, it's very easy to use. You know. Uh, you know, my, my mother, she's 75, she uses the phone and very, very easily, you know, mm -hmm. she does e-commerce. That's yep. because the user interface is it's very, very easy. Mm -hmm. And I think we're not there with, uh, uh, with, with cryptos. The user interface, the way you go about entering into the crypto space is still hard. Yeah. Huh? It's not as, uh, as easy. And, and second is uh, they need to provide better services. Because right now it's like, okay, what can you do with cryptos that you cannot? Yeah, you can bet on NBA final game, but I can go on the Vegas website and bet on, on that too. Yeah. You know? And so what they're building now is the infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, now, what uh, killer applications are going to are gonna be developed on this infrastructure is, uh, is what's going to make it or break it. You know? If you talk to critics of blockchain and cryptos, they say, well, I don't see a killer application here. What is it this, beside trading and making money out of, you know, selling each other this, this, this digital assets, mm. how are people using it? You know, what, what is, what, tell me one application that can be done better with cryptos than without cryptos. Yep. 
that people use on a daily, uh, you know, on a daily level. And we don't have that yet. Yeah. Uh, and so the question is, well, did we have that on the internet uh, in 1995? Maybe email probably was, if I, if I think about it, the email was probably the first killer app yeah. uh, of the internet. Uh, uh, and so, so the question is, uh, once we lay down the, this, this new decentralized infrastructure, can we develop products that are better than the current product we have now? Yeah. I wonder and though- And the answer is, I don't know. I, sure. I, I, look, I, I, I talk to many, you know, skeptics of, of, of cryptos and I, I, you know, I share some of the same concerns. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to get the inverse, the inverse argument here, yeah, right? Yeah. Like what, what are the barriers to entry? I was thinking when you were, you were uh, giving some of those answers about how it may also be right. I remember when the internet was first coming out and I had an AOL screen name and you log in and you block the phone usage while you're getting on there. Mm -hmm. But once you were on there, the things you could do were magical. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. I remember talking to friends of mine on AOL in middle school, and it was like nothing any of us had ever seen before. Yeah. And that has just, con the, we take the magic for granted now because it's everywhere, but uh, it sort of started back in that time and grew exponentially to the whole civilization is now dependent upon these technologies to work. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if it's a, something similar where there is a barrier to entry right now, but for people, and it's obvious that there are so many diehard believers in this space because I would imagine they begin to use this stuff and they realize how much better it actually is than what had existed prior. What's the easiest way currently for people to begin to dip their toes in this if they want to either purchase Bitcoin, Ethereum, or some other crypto cryptocurrency, or just to get involved in the space in general, it's with the preface that there are some barriers to entry right now. It isn't yeah. the easiest thing to get to get your hands on. That's a good question. So uh, to get in is actually quite simple. Mm. So if you want to buy Bitcoin, you go on coin. You know, I don't want to sure. sponsor a, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. an exchange or an other, but an example. Yeah, yeah. Go on Coinbase. Uh, you register. You transfer money on your Coinbase account, and you buy Bitcoin. It's just very, very simple. Yeah. But that's, which is okay, but that's a, an investment in cryptos. That's, but that's not what really I'm talking, when I'm talking about the Internet 2.0, it has to be something about how this new technology changes what we do in our daily life. You know, if you think about the Internet, Internet changed drastically what we do in our daily life. Since the time we wake up, we check our phone yeah. until we go to sleep when we watch Netflix. You know, it really changed uh, our life. Yeah. You know? And so far, uh, blockchain and cryptos have, is just a speculation on trying to get rich by buying some tokens that hopefully you can sell to somebody else at a higher price. Yeah. Huh? And to me, I'm 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 a little turned off by all this speculation. Yeah. You know, I see a lot of people getting rich. You said, oh, you know, people get really, really rich. Yeah. You know, but to me, I, I don't see the, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, 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 Vitaly Buterin. He's one of the founder of of Ethereum, and he said, look. We haven't done anything yet. We haven't changed the world. Yes, all this speculation about all these cryptos, we made a lot of people rich, mm. you know. But in terms of services that we actually provide, that actually change people's lives, mm. uh, we haven't done it yet. Yeah, yeah. You know, now people bet that these services are going to come out in the future. But I, I, I think I would like to focus on that rather than focusing on whether Bitcoin is worth $50,000 versus $5,000. Sure. And I think that that might be helpful to discuss is no one knows the future. No one knows where things are headed. But if if you can, like, imagining 10 to 20 years from now, let's say Ethereum really works and it is one of or is the primary winner. What would that world look like? And, and how would that future differ from the one in which we currently currently live hypothetically um so if you talk to futurists uh about uh about this yeah. you know i'm not a futurist you know <laughs> uh i barely understand the current technology uh, so uh 
people talk about um, <clears throat> two things. The first thing is um, more and more we're going to have robots, robotic agents, bots doing things for us. Mm. Okay. And, uh, and so for robots and computers, in order for do things for us, some of the things that they do for us is to buy stuff, to enter into contracts with other people and so on. And so if you want a robot to do that, they need to have a, a, a payment trail that is linked to the code. Yep. Okay. Now you don't need a distributed ledger. So now China is coming up with their central bank digital currencies. A truly digital currency. It's not decentralized because instead of having, you know, ten thousand nodes deciding whether uh, whether uh, you know the transaction is valid or not, it's just China, yeah. a single server yeah. decides. It's like the bank, but it has a digital currency, okay, uh, that can be embedded into a code, okay. So you don't need to have a decentralized network in order to have a digital currency. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you can think about, so one of the big advantages is this idea of smart contracts uh, uh, embed, and, and embedding payment trails with the code. Um, that is essential in order to, to have bots or robots that are helping our daily lives. Okay? Yep. Yes, the alternative would be, oh, I'm going to put the credit, I'm going to give my robots a credit card. But again, it's, it, the credit card is... Uh, you know, it cannot cannot be done uh, with smart contracts. Uh, the technology is not there. The, the current uh, payment technology is not uh, suited for 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 smart contracts. Yeah, maybe they will in the future. Yeah, but currently it's not. So one one view is, uh, in order for bots to really help our life, they need to have a payment trail that is linked to code, and uh, and and. Cryptocurrency can do that. Yeah, can do it now. Yeah, but it's very expensive, and we don't know, right? I mean, we 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 don't know in principle how this also could evolve, right? I mean, I I don't know that Correct. in 1995 someone maybe some maybe there was a, a wide variety of people who predicted that we would all be carrying around supercomputers in our pockets yeah. and that how that would change everything from you know stock investments to dating to transportation everything. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I don't know if you would agree with this statement, but part of we don't know what we don't know. We we don't yeah. really know how this could evolve. Is that is that fair? Yeah, a fair I assessment? think there is a. I heard. Uh, I don't know if if it's true, um, uh, but Steve Jobs said, uh, "People, you know, s sometimes the economy says, well, if you if it, uh, if there is demand, there is going to be a, a supply yeah. for things, you know." Uh, and and Steve Jobs responded to this saying. People understand what the problem is. They don't understand what the solution is. Yeah. Okay. And so we, uh, people are not good at telling, oh, I need this. Yeah. You know, they're good at uh, complaining about the current system. So yeah. the current payment system, it's slow, it's, uh, it's anti-competitive and it is expensive. Yeah. Okay. And people know that they complain all the time. When I move money from here to Italy, uh, it, it takes, uh, what, three, four days. It's, it's there are a lot of fees. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 you know, like, it's very anti-competitive. Yeah. You know? And so I complain about this. Yeah. You know? Now, I don't know what the solution is. Well, the solution might be cryptos. With cryptos, you lower the, the fees, you increase the speed, you know? Uh, but my point is uh, the, the, the blockchain technology is laying down an infrastructure uh, so that you can do things easier, faster, and cheaper. Yeah. Uh, so that's the potential. I think in the culture, when I have conversations about these subjects with, with friends or, or former coworkers, yeah. they tend to know two cryptocurrencies and it's the two that we've talked about. Yeah. Um, Bit Bitcoin and Ethereum. Yeah. You live in this world mm -hmm. and I'm sure you know far more than two yeah. people that I, I speak with about this subject. Yeah. What, what else are what what are people not talking about that to you in your judgment and your reading about the subject are you do you also think is very worthy of attention and very interesting to you as a potential growth opportunity or yeah. or winner so uh, one of the things that we all are concerned about is privacy mm. okay we live in a world where everything's digital and uh, if it's digital is analyzable and also copyable all right? and um and so 
I, at least, am more and more concerned about uh, my digital footprint in the yeah. world. And uh, especially with cryptocurrencies, yes, they're anonymous. The FBI still can catch you if you if you trade illicit uh, uh, activities using Bitcoin. Mm. Um, but uh, but somehow it's also transparent. So one of the people thinks is the biggest contribution contribution of Bitcoin is that oh it's, it's very transparent. You know you know exactly all the movement uh, of 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 transfer of Bitcoin from one person to another. Yeah. You know. But at the same time, it violates privacy. You know, everybody's gonna if if I know which one is your public address, I can track exactly all the movement, all the expenses that you have done mm-hmm. because it's public. Yeah. Uh, and so th- there are technology that are called zero knowledge proofs, zero knowledge proofs that allow you to actually hide not only who did the transactions, but also the amount of the transaction, the date of the transaction, and so on. Hmm. So basically, it's it's totally private, yeah. not just anonymous, but pri- anonymous is the identity of the people are private, uh, are, are hidden. Private means that nothing comes from it. There's, there's no track of the transaction itself. So yeah. when I give you a you know, $100, there's no track that that happened. Yeah. You know? Uh, and so they are developing these uh, these uh, these new cryptocurrencies. They are completely private. Now you can see that this is a good thing if you want to keep your uh, legit transaction uh, hidden, uh, but also can be problematic uh, for illicit, illicit transactions of drugs and so on. Sure, you know. And uh, but so that that's that's an aspect that I think is in, interesting. How do you protect privacy, especially if blockchain is going to be used, um, not you know, not not just in uh, simple money transactions, but when it comes to medical records, when it comes to uh, you know uh, other type of transactions. Yeah, you know, so the privacy behind uh, a, a, a digital asset. Is, I think it's becoming more and more important. Hmm. And in that space, and I, I, w- I would open it up as yeah. well to other uh, non-encrypted uh, blockchain technologies. Are, are there specific blockchains that you know come to mind as the leader in either the uh, encrypted space, as you were just mentioning, mm-hmm. or the non-encrypted space that are not Bitcoin and Ethereum that you're very high on or you think have potentially a bright future? So one thing we didn't talk about is... Uh, so there are basically two main technologies. One is uh, the cryptocurrencies that are all permissionless, meaning that they're all public. If you want to become a node, you can do it. Mm. The other part uh, of the world of blockchain is what's called the, the permissioned blockchain. Uh, and, and the idea of the permission blockchain is, um, <clears throat> think about Walmart. Walmart uh, wants to track their lettuce from uh, the farmer all the way to the table. Okay, and uh, they are not using Ethereum. What they do is that they get together into a consortium: Ethereum, so uh, Walmart, uh, Costco, HEB, uh, the wholesaler, the farmers. They all come into a, a, a network, mm-hmm. a consortium that is a private consortium. Okay, you want to be part of the Walmart food network? You can't. <laughs> okay, because you're not a farmer. You don't sell lettuce into the into into the network. Yeah, you know, and so these are. A different type of blockchains uh, with very different consensus mechanism uh, you don't have proof of work we talked about proof of work we right. don't have that so the technologically they're a little different uh, but this is also where I, I, I feel there is also innovation there uh, where like how do business to business transaction get validated in a decentralized way mm. but in a way that protects also the privacy of the transactions yeah and so I also am a big believer of what are called uh, private uh, permission blockchain. Uh, now, <laughs> these two camps of cryptos versus uh, uh, permissioned blockchain, sometimes they fight against each other hmm. because uh, uh, you know the 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 crypto people they they they, they see this 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 consortium of uh, of companies and they don't think they are decentralized enough yeah oh. and so there, there is this uh, game that you know people think the more decentralized you are the better it is and I, I always teach my students that look 
decentralization is just is just a feature of your technology. Mm. It's not the end all be all. Yeah. You know, just because your network is more decentralized doesn't mean that it's better. Yeah. You know, decentralization has pros and cons. And so when you use a tool, you always have to figure out, you know, uh, where you set your needle in terms of decentralization, trying to optimize the benefit and minimize the the, the costs. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so it's not that, oh, the more decentralized the, 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 the application is, the better it is. In fact, as an economist, there are several applications that are centralized and they work perfectly. Yeah because of economies of scale. Yeah. You know? It sounds like we are still in the early days of this and it will be interesting to watch what ends up being the result of all of all of these different blockchains. If you are a betting man or if you just hypothetically wanted to bet on this, um, what is your best judgment or your intuition tell you is the most likely outcome here? Will will probably all of these drop to zero or near zero within the, the next twenty years, or are we just at the beginning and at the beginning of a precipice of extraordinary growth and innovation in this space? Or it it it's gonna be somewhere in between. Sure. Uh, I'm I'm less concerned about the value. So, so people always are focused on all oh, the value of Bitcoin, the yeah, value of Ethereum, adoption. for the most for the most part, because because people get tremendously rich about it. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm more interested in uh, in how do we really change people's lives for the better, you know. And in terms of adoption, uh, I'm very positive about smart contracts. But people like my mother is not going to start writing a smart contract. Okay, yeah. they're going to use a tool that is offered by some businesses, some fintech companies and so on, that embeds uh, 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 smart contracts. Yep. And so she's gonna click a button and automatically she enters into a smart contract. She doesn't know even what a smart contract is, but yep. she, you know, I don't know, she wants something and uh, and she clicks a button and in the background you have a smart contract with cryptocurrencies that that allows transaction to happen smoothly yep. and, and moderated and, and so on. Yep. Um, I have a view that so you know you talk to some people that says oh Bitcoin has no value all this crypto this is all a big bubble and then you talk to other people that say oh this is the internet 2.0 and uh, and it's going to revolutionize the entire world my view is more nuanced first of all I don't know yeah. I can see uh, arguments for both sides uh, I think the reality is going to be somewhere in the middle where, you know, like, look, blockchain technology is a technology that is going to be using, that is going to be used in specific areas where it's it's more beneficial than centralized technologies. Yeah. Uh, some areas, some, some, some areas, uh, centralized ledgers are much better. And so we don't see blockchain technology entering into these areas. Yeah. Uh, let me give you an example. <clears throat> FedEx. Okay, FedEx moves packages from uh, from place A to place B. Okay, do they use, so there is a transaction of packages going back and forth. Okay, do they use a blockchain? To, no, I mean FedEx works pretty well. You know, you get a notification, you can track your package. Okay, why did they not use blockchain technology? Well, because it's just one single company. Yep. So there is no issue of about trust, you know, and so they have a centralized ledger where, you know, every time a package, you sc- the, the person scan the package, it's, it moves from uh, Dallas to Austin, it gets recorded, the transaction get recorded in a centralized ledger in Fed, somewhere in a server in FedEx, and it works well, it's cheap, we don't have to have 10,000 nodes trying to figure out whether the package moved from point A to point B. Yep. Huh? When blo- so this is a this is a typical situation in which if you are within an ecosystem where everybody's trusted and uh, and everybody's working on the same goal, then you don't need a blockchain technology. Yep. FedEx works very well. It's cheap. Well, it's not very cheap, but like it's, <laughs> it's you know it, it, technologically it works well. Yeah. Huh? Where te- blockchain technology is needed is when people don't trust each other. So. If you go and tell Walmart to go and work with Costco, 
they're going to say, hell no. You know, I don't trust them. They're going to find out uh, how I move my lattice and how much it costs, how much time it takes, and they're going to steal my ideas and copy what I'm doing and so on. Yep. Okay. So it's very hard for, for, for people to collaborate with each other while they're also competing with each other. Yeah. Okay. And so blockchain technology is, 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 is a way for people to collaborate, but at the same time also compete. Mm. Yeah. I uh, think that's well put. I think, um, the, I'm glad you brought up the idea of how, how this can improve people's lives. Right. I mean, I think when, when the internet was invented or mostly came online in the mid nineties, as someone who was growing up at that time and, and now worked in the 2000s in technology or in, in, in internet-based companies, the day-to-day -day improvements to my own life were evident where life was just more convenient. Life was more flexible with, my, with work. The difference between how my parents were living their life and how I'm living my life, I think there are noticeable, clear improvements in quality of life directly attribu attributable to the internet itself. If you can, and, and maybe we can close on this, mm -hmm. uh, to talk about how, I think you, you put it very well, where this, this technology has the potential to allow uh, people, people or companies who don't trust each other to do business with one another or to interact with, with, uh, with each other in a more fluid way or easier way. Um, what are the potential upsides for civilization, for people that if this does roll out on a larger scale might actually improve our civilization and people's lives specifically? Um, I think it's about, you know, people for good reasons and sometimes bad reasons don't trust each other. Yeah. Yeah. And so if we get to a point where people get to trust more each other because there is a verifiable system that, that allow to, um, to somehow uh, smooth differences between each other yeah. or, or solve conflicts, uh, then then we're gonna be in a better place. Yeah. Okay. Very often wars uh, happens because people don't understand each other or don't trust each other. Hmm. And so any technology or system that uh, enables more verification and and therefore enable people to trust more each other, uh, that's gonna that's gonna change uh, people's lives and the world. Hmm. You know, for for example going back to our bet on who wins the NBA championship. Sure. Okay. If I enter into this contract with you, I need to trust that you have the money. Yeah. I need to trust that uh, if the Spurs win, I need to trust that you're actually going to send me the money. Yeah. Okay. So now I trust you, you know, <laughs> I, and, and so it's okay. Yeah. But if you, if you, if you were different, if I didn't know you, if you lived uh, in Belgium and I never seen you, then how do I trust that it's going to happen? Yeah. Huh? Uh, and so issues of trust are, are big hindrances in society Yeah, for a good reason. You know, people don't trust because sometimes people exploit each other. But then if I can create a system, uh, uh, an ecosystem where, uh, you know, uh, you, you eliminate the need of trust because we enter into smart contracts. I don't have to trust you anymore. I have to just make sure that the, the platform works well. Yep. And then your money is set into escrow. I can see that it, because it's in the code then uh, that facilitate, facilitate interactions and trading. Yeah. And so so I, I think the, the potential is to, that's why it's called a trustless machine. Sure. Sometimes the, the, yeah. the blockchain, they call it trustless machine. Is because the idea is that very often we don't engage with each other because we don't trust each other. Yeah. And if we find a mechanism to engage by not needing the trust, yeah because I can verify that, hey, your money is in the escrow account, uh, then that can can make our life better. It's, fa it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, this was super educational, and I really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy. Um, thank you, and for people who are curious about learning more, maybe quickly I'll just ask this. Where would you direct people, either your own publications, your own website, other materials to learn more about the subject? So for, 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 for blockchain, uh, this is one issue. Also, the, the production of information is decentralized. <laughs> uh, there, are, there are a lot of resources uh, if you want to learn more about it. Mm, a, a little bit of uh, self-promotion. I actually have an edX uh, uh, course mm -hmm. on, on blockchain. Okay. 
uh, so people can actually take that class if okay. they if they want to. Uh, they want to learn more about uh, how blockchain works, what are the different cryptos, and so on. So basically, it's a in depth. Uh, uh, class on, on blockchain. Okay. So that's one way. Uh, the blockchain initiative at Texas uh, 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 McCombs uh, is is also another great source yep. uh, for for information, uh, or just uh, just Google it. Okay, fair enough. Thanks here for the time. It's a great meeting you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Keep Talking. If you are finding value in this podcast, please consider supporting the show on Patreon at patreon.com backslash keep talking podcast. I truly appreciate all of you who are supporting the show. 